the, the first panel of the afternoon is uh, a panel of the institutional leadership of uh, shipping. We have with us the heads of the four uh, major industry uh, organizations, um, ICS, BIMCO, Intertanco, and Intercargo. And uh, Mr. Hugo Salerno, the uh, chairman of uh, RINA, is going to uh, moderate this panel, so I'm, uh, I'd like to thank you all. Frankly, having you all here every year, and I hope we will continue doing that, it, it's absolutely terrific because you are the people who are really pushing the industry forward. And therefore, having you every year share with us new developments, new insights, is so valuable. So thank you very, very much. And Ugo, thank you for uh, taking the, uh, the task of uh, moderating this amazing group. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having invited me to moderate this uh, uh, incredible panel because we have the representatives of the major organization in shipping in the world. So I will uh, not take time to make an introduction because I think it will be more interesting for you to listen to the four uh, chairmen of the associations. Uh, I have a few questions that uh, partly have been already touched during the morning and some of them maybe are uh, slightly uh, different. And uh, I think uh, they are all in position to answer to all the questions. So let's see how we will uh, discipline ourselves because we have not uh, a, com let's say, escaletta, how do you call in Italy? So let's see how we are able to, to work together and uh, to take uh, uh, your attention because the, the, their opinions are fundamental for the development of shipping, I think. And the first point, of course, uh, we have heard uh, uh, in many, many times all the morning speaking about the uh, transfer, the energy, the energy transition. Energy transition uh, uh, is, uh, uh, according to Fati Birol, that is the, the chairman of International Energy Association, he says, this is the biggest challenge that humans have ever uh, found in front of themselves. It is really a, a difficult uh, transition. First of all, let's see that it is a transition and not a switch to the perfect world. Uh, but uh, another important thing is that shipping is the hardest to abate industry. We are listening a lot about hard to abate industries, but shipping is the hardest to abate because vessels are going around and are far from the places, uh, for the most part of the time, are far from the places where they can be fueled. And therefore, the use of fuel, of a specific fuel that gives uh, the possibility to emit less CO2, it's much more difficult than onshore. Uh, so uh, let's uh, see what are the possibilities that we have in shipping in order to uh, decarbonize and to meet the goals that we have uh, seen uh, that have been fixed by the international organization, first of all, uh, IMO. So who is willing to start and open and break the ice on this uh, topic? Manuel, I see that... Uh, Th thank you, Hugo. First of all, I would like to thank today the organizer because this has been an outstanding conference. I think this morning we really heard that some top speakers and uh, you are right in saying that this is a hard to abate industry and things, it will not be an easy ride, but said this, I think today there was I think the most positive atmosphere I have ever heard in a conference about this decarbonization, which is complicated, but I think it, it, it was very well expressed by Melina that the seaborne trade is a necessity. This started probably in Greece with the Odysseus. Then after we heard Plutarco saying, navigare necesse est, and then, again, nothing has changed in three, 4,000 years. We need to navigate and we need to find solutions. Today, unfortunately, solutions are not available. This must be clear. We cannot go and ask for methanol. We cannot go and ask for ammonia. We don't have the engines. We have. This was clearly expressed by Malina that, unfortunately, we are not building ships. 
and we do not distribute or refine the oil. So it, it, this is not our business. So we need a complex and more than even the normal stakeholders that we have. Of course, port will play an important role, but this is, as you rightly said, a big revolution. But in this big revolution, to hear also the Secretary General of IMO giving a determined yes to such a good question that was posed to him, this also explains how positive is the atmosphere. Now, I think we have to understand that probably to look at this, we have to separate probably the short-term things that we can do, some things that we can do in the medium term, and some things that we could look in the long term. Starting from the short term, I think that vessels can become, and even with retrofit, some of the existing vessels more efficient. And I think that alone will save relevant amount of fuel and uh, emissions if they are put in place. Then, of course, building new ships today, we could look at have them ready, especially with the engines of tomorrow, for methanol, for ammonia, for other solutions. The vessel can be built ready to accommodate such engines. And, but, of course, they can be much more efficient, partly because of the propeller, the design, the paint. The, there are a lot of things. Probably in port, they can be, uh, they can have, uh, um, they can be plugged in. There are several possibilities, or they can have some solar panels in certain type of ships. So you, you can definitely reduce dramatically also the consumption of fuel on the existing vessel. Then, uh, if we look, I think another very important point that was pointed out already before is that we should not discourage different solutions because different solutions might apply to different type of ships. If we are talking about short haulage for small vessels, why not electrical? Probably the battery, big batteries could be the answer in a few years. But we are talking of small ships for small trajects. But of course, if we talk then about, oh, uh, it is clear that uh, if we look at passenger ships, probably people are worried about using ammonia, at least in the beginning, because it's poisoning, high, uh, very poisoning. Uh, so probably this could be something not really the best solution for passenger ships, but then we could look at methanol or other possibilities, even biofuels that could be combined with the existing fuel. So there are really several possibilities. We have to explore and also I'm sure that carbon capture will play an enormous role. We already know that the power of carbon capture will be decuplicated in a few years, you know, two, three years. And of course that might be necessary in any case because 100 years of uh, emissions <laughs> need to be addressed if you want to go back at the climate with 0 0.5 less probably, a lot of carbon has to be, in any case, captured in the not distant future. Then long term, we hear a lot about nuclear, that could be also a possibility because we need a dramatic increase of energy and probably renewables who can play a very big role for the electricity, they will not be sufficient to address uh, this case, especially even for uh, the industry that consume a lot of uh, uh, electricity. So I, I think really we have to look, but the biggest message that we have today is that everybody is positive, everybody is working together, and we are looking, you know, all this skepticism that we had in the beginning, a few years ago, uh, today is not present anymore. And I think also, it's very important to note, and probably this also is unique, that the association of ship owners, including ICS and many of our, our colleagues, have been thinking and advocating these rules even before the IMO. 
And I think this was the case. We, we came to a conclusion of a net zero emission probably one year before. Therefore, that shows how responsible, and I would say also, uh, how much the ship owners are looking to find a, a, a solution as early as possible, and of course with the due constraints that we have. Thank you. I, I, I think the commitment of ship owners must be brought outside of this room, because I'm sure that in this room everybody is convinced about that. But we should let the out word. Uh, as I was saying just a few days ago together, we are preaching to the uh, converted. Uh, we need to preach to people that is not yet converted. But sorry, uh, we have not long time. Unfortunately, the time is uh, uh, really short. I would like to ask uh, uh, to the other uh, members uh, of the panel to, to make some comment. Um, what is available now, if, of course, we exclude the LNG, which is not decarbonization, let's face it is reducing, but is not, um, really there is nothing around. What happened, uh, we just saw uh, a French charter who took uh, five ships on period, of five new buildings which are methanol, and, uh, and uh, this is the only way I can see it for a tanker owner today to look at a different thing than really fuel oil or biofuels blended in fuel. Because uh, for tramp shipping, by definition, we never know where we go. So uh, either we have already an alternative fuel which is available everywhere in the world, and this is not the case, or we cannot just risk our capital doing on speculation. Let's call it speculation. It's never really speculation. A new building with uh, a different fuel from what we are burning already today. So I think tram shipping will be the last one to understand what this fuel will be on the basis of the availability of this bunker around. Grazie, Ugo. And many thanks to Olga, Nico, and the excellent uh, Capital Link uh, team. And <clears throat> I think that uh, ship operators are incredibly keen to uh, decarbonize. Um, I don't think that there's any lack of willingness. But um, as uh, Melina said in her speech, this can only be achieved through collaboration. Uh, and at the moment, uh, only ship owners and ships are being regulated. And we have to understand that this will cause distortions on our path to decarbonization. But we have a good global regulator, uh, an IMO, at IMO, and we must be thankful for that. An IMO has set out a roadmap and it realize, and realizes that we cannot fast forward to full decarbonization immediately. And this is really important. And we, we are going to have intermediate phases in technology and the availability of these green fuels. And we must celebrate the success of these intermediate phases, which will help us to meet the final targets. We must not be negative about these intermediate uh, phases. And of course, we also have to realize the long-term goals, which could be nuclear or it could be hydrogen. Um, so we have to take a, a measured approach using the maximum technology and fuel availability that is uh, available. However, and this is what uh, uh, Paolo said very clearly, our regulator must also not damage the inherent and huge efficiencies of, our, of shipping's two main shipping models, which is the liner model and the tramp bulk model. And if these models are severely impacted by poor decarbonization regulation, the impact will be much worse than a combination of the Red Sea, the Ukraine, and Panama 100 times over. So we have to understand that the inherent efficiencies of the models must be uh, maintained. Um, 
within the tramp bulk sector, which is, uh, lies the dry, the dry bulk cargo sector, uh, at the moment, it's probably the largest with about 13,000 uh, ships. And um, there are particular parts of this sector, and I think that um, Manuela said that for the smaller vessels, you know, we have thousands of bulk carriers which are below about 80,000 tons, and these are very, very hard to decarbonize uh, immediately. Um, and we also have to look at realism today, if you are a dry cargo ship owner and you go to a shipyard and the shipyards are, are full until about 2027, we have to realize that the shipyards are largely offering still what we, what we would call conventional vessels. So these vessels that will be delivered in 2027 will still be on the water in 2047. So we have to, we have to temper our progress with realism. But we have to be hopeful. And sustainable biofuels, carbon capture technologies uh, do provide uh, hope and they do provide progress as long as they're uh, supported by good uh, regulations. Um, and, and finally, let's not forget the existing fleet, about 65,000 large vessels, and we cannot uh, wipe this fleet out overnight. So we have to uh, find solutions uh, that will get us to 2050 uh, in, a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable fashion. So technology and availability of green fuels will, get, will help us to reach our goals. And um, as a bit of good news, the dry bulk sector is probably already very close to meeting its 2030 uh, uh, goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dimitris. Nikolaus, what, what thank, is your thank, view? Thank you much. Mo most said, I will make this very brief. There are <laughs> yeah. three reasons why I'm really optimistic that uh, the 2030 goal will be met. So I continue on where you just uh, left it, Dimitri. First of all, and that is a message we have to bring outside of this room. You said don't <laughs> preach to the converted, uh, but I find this an extremely interesting a message. Our industry already is extremely efficient. Uh, I always use this example of the 40 grams emitted per ton mileage by vessels if you take the average of the 60,000 uh, vessel existing. And then we use the example of the jogger who goes one mile jogging and during this one mile he emits 80 grams, twice as much when you go do your evening stroll, then the shipping industry on average does per ton mileage in emission. I find that an amazing figure and I wish that everybody in the world would realize that. The second reason why I'm optimistic is that we already came a long way. In 2008, the shipping industry as a whole, and you remember those days, uh, 23, 22 knots, container ship boom, etc. The industry emitted 1.1 billion tons of CO2. Today, that is less. We don't have exact numbers, but we have improved. We have improved mainly by slow steaming, of course not driven by the environmental protection, but by market considerations. But now we have measures in place to protect these savings, CII, EEXI, etc. The fleet is growing, so there's a lot to do until 2030. But according to our expectations, this will be done by efficiency gains, Blue Wispy uh, consortium, uh, operational efficiencies, technological efficiencies, um, and it will be done by biofuel. So we don't need the long-waited for ammonia and uh, methanol fuels to reach 2030. That is the second round. So the third reason why I'm optimistic for 2030 is that the attitude in the industry has changed. Five years ago, people were very skeptical about decarbonization, very skeptical about the collaboration with the regulator. We heard Arsenio today, we heard Fortini today saying that they are open-minded in finding the way how to do this path. And if you are 
starting a very long walk. It's much better to do that with optimism and not with complaining it's cold, I don't have the right shoes, it may start to rain and what have you. It's good to say, yes, let's look at the chart together and let's try to find a good, good, good way to reach that. And that, that is the attitude in the industry that we sense at BIMCO and that, that is the attitude that we sense in IMO gives this great optimism that, that 2030 will be done. Thank you. That would be my statement for that. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolaus. So just to, to summarize very quickly, first thing, especially people in shipping, avoid to make jogging because otherwise the emissions will be terrible and you will pay more <laughs> ETS. Uh, second, uh, there is only one energy uh, that does not pollute. It's the energy that we don't use. So efficiency is the name of the game, the most important thing. And shipping is doing this in an extremely efficient way, efficiency in an efficient way. Uh, neutrality, technological neutrality, it's fundamental in order to avoid to take decisions that then can prove wrong. So let's keep all the doors open and let's follow the technological development. And last but not least, and maybe the most important point, uh, somebody has to take care also of the availability of fuels because vessels, if have not a point where to collect this fuel, will not be able to decarbonize. So there must be a cooperation between ships and shore. And I think our regulators uh, need to be involved also, also in this point. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, I think that uh, the, the energy transition is bringing also to a lot of changes in trades. Uh, for example, electrical cars. Electrical cars are now becoming a reality and will become a reality in Europe by 2035. There is a lot of uh, uh, movement of cars because there is to replace, it is uh, necessary to replace a large number of cars. Now there are some uh, very happy uh, operators of car carriers today. Uh, let's think to Manuel, but let's think to Nicolaus also. Uh, do you think that this is going to continue in this direction? Is it also going to increase? Or it is uh, a moment in which we see this uh, market, this buoyant market? Today, we are happy to see that the market is good. It's good for uh, most of the operators, I would say all the operators of Carcari. But if we make an analysis, of course, the, um, when there is a good market, we all built a lot. So there are, there are about 200 vessels under construction. What has really changed is, is, I think you mentioned two things. One is that, of course, we need the EVs and uh, probably also some hybrid cars to try to reduce the, the consumption in, in a sector which is much less hard to abate than ours, because today the solutions are available already as far as the cars are concerned. Of course, they need infrastructure. We can learn from this lesson, even in shipping, because, for instance, in some countries, it now became the other way around, probably in Norway. I have heard that people find difficulties to buy petrol, because if they have a petrol car, uh, there are no more stations. You can buy energy, you can buy renewables, you can buy uh, electricity, but uh, it's difficult to find a place where to buy some oil. So, uh, again, you know, we need, today we have a problem of, of infrastructure in many countries that did not move yet. But apparently it's cheaper. The cars are becoming cheaper and cheaper. I just bought a small Topolino for 7,000 euros. I think you cannot buy anything else in Italy for that amount of money. So, and this is a Stellantis car, not a Chinese car. Uh, so actually, uh, I think that it, it will happen. It is moving. Probably, again, we have to learn lessons that in Europe and in the Western part of the world, we don't have companies that produce batteries. Probably the same applies for chips. And uh, I think we have to move. Uh, in, in China, there are today the biggest producer of batteries are there. The biggest market for cars is there. The biggest market producing EV cars is China. And some of these companies are becoming bigger. We, we all know about Tesla, but BYD is bigger than Tesla and produce more cars than Tesla. In about 
50, 60 years, the Japanese invaded probably Europe with cars. I remember the few, when I was a young boy in, in, in England, there were few Celica, Toyota Celica, Nissan, Sherry, but very, very few cars. Then uh, they now export about 4 million cars. What happened in 50 years for the Japanese? It happened in about 3, 4 years and during the pandemic <laughs> in China. So they are exporting today more than 4 million cars. I think in December they were exporting 500,000 cars. So again, there is the need, but there are 200 vessels under construction. The market is an interesting market, but I think really what we have to learn is the lesson, because probably some of the things that they did, uh, can, for instance, the organization of uh, the electricity for our ships when they are in port, if we don't uh, start, uh, now in the ports in Europe, we have to really start for core ironing because uh, the request from Europe is tomorrow, 90, 2030, where all passenger ships have to be plugged in. And many ports didn't start yet anything. So we need to create an infrastructure, but the same, we need a, to create an infrastructure also for road travel. And please, I think this is a very important point. Shipping is responsible for 1.8%, 2%. I think that the automotive is more than uh, somebody saying between 10 and 15. So this is the type of, so automotive is much more important, but the regulators have been tougher with us, for instance, the ETS, and app apparently in the automotive, where there is a reply, where there is a solution, they, they have moved up the dates from one to the other. Probably their lobby is much more powerful than ours. <laughs> Thank you. The automaking industry maybe has more uh, capacity of lobbying. Uh, Nikolaus, you are the other one who is smiling in this moment for uh, this market. Just a, a, an additional question. Uh, did you hear something from the underwriters? Because sometimes underwriters are becoming, are saying that they are becoming worried about the fact that lithium batteries can be uh, dangerous. I don't know if it is true or not, but uh, is this uh, going to have some effect on uh, the trade, uh, the car trade? Yes, thank, th thank you. Uh, one comment to the, to the market development. Yes. Um, Manuel Grimaldi is the uh, charterer and there's, there's one rule in, in shipping and that is the charterer is right. So we are yes. just humble servants to the industry uh, as a tonnage provider. And uh, Melina is an operator, so you are also right. But uh, we are very happy to be in the market and to have the possibility to service you. Now, with regards to the uh, lithium batteries, um, I hear that the insurance companies have not raised uh, premiums uh, uh, regarding that yet. And if you bring the ships, uh, the, the, the cars on the ships with less than 20% of loading status of these lithium batteries, it's a fairly safe uh, thing to do. And I look at the two charters and they are nodding, so I must be right. Yeah, thank you. If the charters say so, uh, it's okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let, let me continue with the different trades that are coming, uh, thanks or due to the uh, transition. Uh, Dimitrios, uh, do you think that we will see sooner or later, let's say in the medium to, to to short to medium term, a change in the transport of the major uh, energy commodities like coal, like oil, uh, and how this uh, transition, is this transition going to affect also the steel industry and therefore we will see also some changes in this direction. Thank you, uh, Ugo. I will, I will cover coal and I think uh, Paolo will cover the oil. <laughs> so, um, no, undoubtedly our seaborne coal trade will be uh, negatively uh, affected. And um, again, shipping cannot predict this in isolation. Um, when will the green fuels become widely economically and safely available to the shoreside consumers and the shoreside industries? We don't know. Uh, it will not happen overnight. And uh, every country will wish to provide its citizens with basic electricity supplies, so we mustn't forget that. 
And uh, coal will still play an important part of the electricity supply for many nations. Uh, but on the positive side, so uh, the increasing world population will drive demand for other dry bulk commodities like grain, iron ore, bauxite, and others. And this extra, um, uh, this extra demand will partly cover the coal uh, shortfall. And in addition, we are looking at uh, the certain carbon capture processes. And these, in these carbon capture processes, a solid carbonate will be formed. And this solid carbonate, if it's uh, available in large quantities, this will also be transported at sea by, by bulk carriers. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitrios. And uh, we go to carbon capture because it is one of the important technologies that are fastly developing. And I think uh, this is uh, a, an opportunity for tanker owners, and this is uh, what I was willing to ask Paolo. And in addition to that, the figures for the transport of ammonia are also uh, really amazing because the, the, um, uh, the feeling is that uh, by uh, 2050, we will see about 420, mi uh, sorry, 250 million tons of ammonia transported by sea because of the growth of population and the need for more fertilizers, but also because ammonia will become a source of energy for, for shipping. In addition to that, uh, by 2035, the forecasts say that about 420 million of CO2 will be captured. A part, maybe a large part of this, will be liquefied and transported by sea. So it is an opportunity uh, for tanker owners uh, and uh, how you can uh, uh, face uh, the, the challenges that are coming from these changes. <clears throat> First of all, I learned this afternoon that more the car carrier operator will be profitable and more the tanker owner will be losing money because they are moving electrical cars which are putting us out of the market. So this, my dear Nico, we have to remember. <laughs> Said that. Of course, uh, CO2, ammonia are the commodities of the future. Uh, already uh, the oil tanker community is moving in gas tanker. They, they did it heavily and Greece has been on the forefront of all this. And we are going to see this going, growing more and more. Of course, there will be more gas, less liquid, less fluids, and, uh, but for us it's not a problem because the market, as you say, is going to be of such a dimension that there is a space for everybody. So uh, I'm not really worried about what is going to happen. And oil, anyhow, is going to take a long time to disappear. So what we are doing today is going to be needed for quite a long period of time. So I'm quite optimistic about my colleagues. I am on my way out. But for those who are staying in, I think there is a lot of things to do still. Uh, I think one of the important traits of liquid CO2 will be also for the production of synthetic fuels uh, because this is one of the things that will happen and that will solve partly because it is a transition solution uh, because the, the, if CO2 is captured by emitters uh, is always added to the atmosphere but uh, in less amount. But another trade will be CO2, liquid CO2 transported to uh, the producers of uh, um, uh, synthetic fuels. Now let me put uh, a, a little bit uncomfortable question to all of you. Uh, I think the digitalization is uh, letting all the uh, shipping companies uh, is giving them the possibility to be uh, basically on board of ships because the connection is uh, uh, extremely efficient now is, uh, and we can be connected all the time with the vessel. And the information that is flowing from the vessel to shore is letting ship owners to perfectly understand what is happening and maybe also taking some decisions. But if decisions are taken, this is changing the paradigm of responsibility because one of the important things is to clearly understand where stays the responsibility for decisions uh, in shipping. Uh, 
do you think and that this digitalization and the strong connection is going to change the responsibilities between ship and shore or do you think that at a certain moment we will have a point where this responsibility will stay on board clearly up to a certain level and at which level I don't know. Actually, I really don't advocate this to happen. Firstly, because the master on board, he is on the ship, and I think he has to take the right decision. I wouldn't expect that somebody who is remote and is not risking his life, that should take the decision instead of the master. Probably in a very distant future with unmanned vessel, probably if this will be the case, probably this will be the answer. But until there is a master on board, I think that uh, he has to take the responsibility and the decision. But uh, I think that uh, the digitalization can bring a lot of other benefits in making other decisions, uh, storage on board, detecting fire on board, for instance, detecting info a lot of information which today are not available, even in uh, the commercial part. What about selling passengers? Today is all digitalized. They book their own room and uh, they save a lot of costs for a lot of people in, in the office. So digitalization can help in making the right decisions since the data available is much more than what a normal brain can d digest. So I, I think it's not really a question of uh, um, moving responsibility from one place to the other. Then I, I, I don't Thank think you. that this would be wise. Thank, Thank you. you, Manuel. Paolo, what do you think about that? I think it's up to us in the sense it's up to each company how you organize the, the distribution of power and, uh, and the responsibilities. Uh, of course, I started in this job, but we, we didn't even have satellite communication. We still had the, the cables, and we're hearing about the ship once every three, four days. But today, everything is on real time. There is the temptation from the office of trying to interfere what they are doing on board. I think it's a mistake. We should leave them and, and let them make the decision and we control them what they are doing. But it's up to us to decide how we want to do it. It's, it's, the, the tools are there for, to do a lot of things, but it's still the human being who decides what, what, what we want. Dimitrios. Yes, thank you, Hugo. As a technologist, digitalization uh, has a lot to offer. Um, and and the, the technology is actually going to be superseded by this question of responsibility. However, I still think that if a seafarer knows that all this information is going ashore without managing the process, as uh, Paolo says, that seafarer will cease being a seafarer cease being on that ship for the reason that he, is, he or she are on that ship. And therefore, uh, we need to be very, very careful because a lot of the data that goes on shore is often, the shore side does not have the capacity to, uh, to process and to control that data, even though we discussed over lunch that AI may help here. So uh, yes, digitalization will shift things, but we must not forget that, that the, the people on board must retain the final say. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitrios. Uh, we are running short of time. If you uh, allow me, I will put you another question that for me, uh, I think, and that it is of uh, great actuality. What do you think is going to happen uh, with these problems of Red Sea, of Suez Canal? Do you think it will continue and uh, how we can uh, manage this? Well, Thank you for taking away the difficult question regarding digitalization <laughs> and coming up with an even more difficult question. Um, no, on a more serious note, um, there are three aspects to that. The one is that the free trade and the right of navigation is the backbone of everything we do in this room and what most people do that participate in the global economy. The the second aspect of it, which is extremely important and sometimes underestimated, is that our seamen are not educated for this. 
they are not uh, prepared for this and they are not supposed to run a danger like that. So uh, we have to circumvent these areas and, 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 and we do that. The third aspect to it is that these attacks are not attacks on specific, in this case it's called uh, Houthi, uh, Israel-related attacks in Ukraine, it's called an, an attack on Ukraine. These are attacks on our Western values, these are attacks on all of us, of what we believe and what we uh, stand for. So we have to be extremely grateful to those countries that participate in fighting that, um, whether some countries choose to do it on a diplomatic way or some countries choose to do it on a military way because they can and because they have the means is both equally important, but uh, we cannot be divided in a discussion about the necessity to fight that. Now, how long will that last? You asked me. The insurance companies have just uh, on Monday withdrawn coverage going through with regards to war insurance. Um, that has us fear that it will last for a little uh, while, but giving in is certainly not an option. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I must confess, uh, Nicolas, that I am a bit sad because you gave me the opportunity and I am very grateful to have a discussion with these four personalities. And uh, I would have liked to have much more time to, to learn uh, something from them. Unfortunately, the time is over and I think I was 1.5, one and a half minutes late. Uh, and therefore, I thank very much the uh, speakers here, and I thank very much Nicolas for uh, having me here and for having organized a so beautiful conference. Thank you. Thank you.